Such an honor to have you here. Thank you. Wow, what a joy to have you here. Well, we've been celebrating our 80th anniversary. In case you've been missing out, we're still in the season of Makahiki and celebrating all of the wonderful things that have happened here in the last 80 years. And one of the epics of ministry here was the epic of Reverends David and Donna McClure. And I was so glad when I heard that they could be here and that Reverend David was available to speak here. And I thought it was perfect timing as we've been celebrating our 80th anniversary. And uh, I'm just telling you, this morning's message <laughs> spoke to me right at the point of my need. And so I invite you to open your heart to be spoken to by spirit right at the point of your need. Reverend David McClure was the minister here from 83 to 91, and then at Unity of Windward from 2003 to 2009. In 2016, and I was present, he was, this is a very high award in the Unity Movement at our annual convention. He was given the Charles Fillmore Award. And although he's retired, he still teaches classes as an adjunct instructor for Unity Worldwide Ministries for the classes. He's writing a book. His wife, Donna, is a Unity minister ordained in 2002. She went through her chaplain training here in Honolulu and is now chaplain in a Sacred Heart Hospital in Spokane, Washington. As you know, hospital chaplaincy is very dear to my heart. I am so grateful for Reverends David and Donna McClure. Let's give them a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Tim, and thank you to you and Olga Lucia, Olga, for inviting us to be back home. Aloha, Honolulu. <clears throat> this is our, uh, a very important spiritual home that we've had the pleasure of being a part of for many years. Um, some of you might remember Stan Hampson, who was minister here back in the 60s and 70s. Anybody here when Stan was here? Good, glad to hear that. <clears throat> well, Stan and I uh, go back a long ways. Uh, we were uh, roommates and students in the same ministerial program back at Unity Village to become ministers. And we've kept in touch over the years uh, when Stan was here, I was in Sydney, Australia, uh, conducting ministry. But we've, our paths have crossed over the years. And I was talking to him on the phone the other day, and he reminded me of a couple of things that tie into your 80th uh, anniversary celebration. We all know Marie, Marie Handley was the founder of this church. And uh, Stan reminded me that uh, Maria Handley sailed from San Francisco aboard a steamer on September 8th, 1937, which just happens to be my birthday. <laughs> and after she got here, her first unity service was held on October 10th, 1937. It just happens to be Stan's birthday. So we really... We're 80 with you this year. <clears throat> and um, my connection goes back far to, farther, too, in that uh, Dorothy Pearson, who was one of the co-ministers here, 
was my first minister when I was six years old. So uh, there's a legacy here. There's a connection that uh, always brings me back, and I'm delighted to have that opportunity. We are delighted, Donna and I, to be with you this morning. John Smith. John Smith was the only Protestant living in a Catholic neighborhood and um, comes around Lent, the first Friday in Lent, and John goes out to grill a juicy steak on his grill. And all the Catholics, of course, are inside having their tuna fish dinner. But the wafting of this beautiful steak grilling comes through the windows and they smell this and all of they wish they could have a steak, but it's the first Friday of Lent. And they can't do that. And it happens on the second Friday of Lent and the third and finally on the fourth and final one. It's still happening. So they decide to get together and see if they could go over and convert John Smith to Catholicism. <clears throat> and they do, they go over, and glory be, he says, yes, I'll become a Catholic. So they're overjoyed, and they take him to the church, and the <clears throat> priest takes holy water and sprinkles it on John Smith and says, you were born a Baptist. You were raised a Baptist, and now you are a Catholic. Ta-da, he's a Catholic. So the neighbors are all very happy and excited, and they think we'll no longer be tempted by the smell of uh, steak grilling on the barbie. So next Lent rolls around. They're in having their fish dinner on the first Friday in Lent, and here it comes again, the smell of steak wafting through their homes. And they look at each other and they think, we've got to do something about this. So they call each other up and they finally decide we better go over and talk to John. He maybe forgot that that was one of the, the rules, that you don't eat meat on Friday. So they go over there and they find John in the backyard in front of his grill. <clears throat> <clears throat> and he's sprinkling water on the steak. <laughs> and he's saying, you were born a cow. You were raised a cow. But now you are a fish. <clears throat> Wouldn't it be great if we could do that? Well, I'm here to tell you this morning that you can. Every one of us in this room can do that. We have the power to call things and make them become what we call them. You remember way back when, when there was this uh, commercial for Hanes underwear and there was Inspector 12. And she comes out and she says, they don't say Hanes till I say they say Hanes. Well, nothing is anything until you say it is. You have the power to make it whatever it is in your life. It has no value, it has no power, it has nothing until you give it meaning, until you give it value and significance or devalue and insignificance in your life. We have that ability, that is a power to make any situation, any person, any aspect of life mean whatever we want it to mean to us. And once it becomes what we make of it, then it influences our experience and our life. There was a shipwrecked sailor who found himself washed up on a beach in a remote island and he uh, came to his senses and he could hear drums beating off in the distance and he decided that he would follow the beat of the drums and 
take them wherever they led, and it led them, he led to a clearing where here were all these natives dancing and chanting and, and bowing down to a huge rock that was in the middle of the circle. And they were all bowing down to this rock and they were chanting and dancing and having a great old time. So he goes up to one of the natives and he said, that rock, that's a fantastic rock. What do you call that rock that you worship? And the man says, we call that rock nothing. And the guy says, oh my God, is nothing sacred? <laughs> well, that's my question to you this morning. Is nothing sacred? Or perhaps the better question is, which part of your life is sacred and which part of it do you consider not sacred? Which part of your life do you consider questionable or uh, detestable or um, outside of the realm of your experience? You know, I was so impressed at the first service. Tim was talking to our beautiful gay men's chorus who were... Uh, singing with us this morning. And she said, and he said, in this church, you are not tolerated here, you are celebrated. This is a place, and it's always been that way for 80 years, certainly when I was here, where every person is not tolerated, but celebrated. <clears throat> <clears throat> It reminds me of uh, when Pope John passed away and he went to heaven and he met St. Peter at the pearly gates and um, St. Peter said, Holy Father, we're honored to have you here. It's a very sacred pleasure. Um, is there anything you would like to do while you're here? And he said, I'd like to go to your reference library. There's a lot of ancient volumes there and I'd like to you know, go back and get the origins of some of these words and some of these um, testament passages. So they escort him to the, <clears throat> to the library and he's sitting there. And all of a sudden, St. Peter, who's back at the gate, hears, ah, ah, and he runs down to the library and several of the uh, archangels run with him and they, they see Pope John with his head in his hands, and he's going, oh my God, there's a gnar in it. And uh, St. Peter says, uh, pardon me, uh, Holy Father, what do you mean there's a gnar in it? The word has a gnar in it. It's celebrate. Yes. Laughter <laughs> 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 yeah, all right. Uh, take your time. You can work, <coughs> work on that one. <coughs> what I'd like to propose to you this morning is that you make everything in your life, and I mean everything, sacred. The word sacred comes from a Latin word, Sacer, which means holy. And the word holy comes from the Old English, which means to make whole. And to make whole means to include it in the wholeness of life, to make it a part of the whole. And that's what making sacred does. Rather than excluding and, and uh, judging and differentiating and uh, tolerating, it brings everything together and says it's all sacred. It's all part of the divine plan. It's all a part of what Stan Hampson used to call O-P-O-P-G-G-O. That was his license plate when he lived in uh, California. It means there's one presence, one power, God the good, omnipotent. O-P-O-P-G-G-O. -G -G -O. 
And that means there's only God going on. There's nothing else. There, that means everything is for you and nothing is against you. Otherwise, it's not O-P-O-P-G-G-O. It's duality, it's differentiation, it's judgment, it's separation. And my suggestion in a unity church, God forbid that we should ever think of anything other than unity in a unity church. One presence and one power. When we include stuff in that one presence and one power, whether that be a person or a place or an experience that we have. In other words, we bring it into the spiritual perspective as a part of the whole. Then the universe is saying, that thing is happening for me and not to me. Imagine that. Everything in your life today, I don't care what it is, who it is, what it's about, how long you've been dealing with it, is for you. That means it has value, it has worth, it has spirit at work in it in some fashion or in some way. It is not working against you. It is sacred. Your journey on this planet is a sacred journey. It has always been from the moment you were born. And I certainly know that about my journey. And it continues, and I'm grateful that I have had the opportunity to continue a journey that I thought was over about three and a half years ago. And I was in a place where I was not blessing everything in my life, it's especially my body. <laughs> I was cursing it because it, I thought it was trying to kill me. You ever thought of that about your body, that it was trying to kill you? <laughs> it doesn't have the power to do that, but uh, it tries. But I recognized, as Myrtle Fillmore, uh, Tim reminded me of Myrtle Fillmore, who um, looked at every cell in her body when she was given six months to live and blessed every cell, made it sacred. And she went on to live, I don't know, 30, 40 more years. So making it sacred does that. It says, this is part of the divine plan. This is not some marauding force that is trying to kill you or destroy you or, or diminish you in any way. This has value in it. This experience, there's a pony in there somewhere, <laughs> if you're willing to find it. The Bible tells us that we have this power to name things, whatever we want to name them. And so whatever you name an experience, well, this is bad, this is terrible, this is awful, this is pretty good, this could be better. These are the names, these are the meanings, these are the values that we give to every situation in our life. And as we give them their value, then they have the power either to bless us or to injure us or hurt us or diminish us in some way. Some way. So we have the power to know this about ourselves. Some days I'm sure you say, as I've said to my body, this darn body, this damn body of mine <laughs> is going to do me in. And uh, so we curse our body instead of blessing it. Right now, there are situations going on in your life and in the world that you wonder about. You're not sure whether this is of any value to you or any significance or uh, there's anything you can learn from the experience. And so perhaps you may be cursing it or cursing them or him or whoever it may be. Jesus showed us how to, what happens when you bless something and what happens when you curse something. Remember, he blessed the lepers, and he blessed the children, and he blessed the sick and the blind, and made them whole when he blessed them. And just for good measure, he cursed the fig tree, and it withered and died. And that's what happens when we curse anything or anyone. 
And in his all-great, his all-time great sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, you remember the Beatitudes? The Beatitudes, he took all kinds of mixed up and different kinds of people and states of mind. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the mo- they that mourn. Blessed are those that are persecuted. No matter who he was talking about, he said, blessed are you and everything about you. And he included them as a part of the package, as a part of the whole. And even on the cross, when he was thinking about those that had put him on the cross, what did he say to them? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He didn't say, you dirty rats. He blessed them. And he had a pretty good result from that forgiveness, as I recall. So what if you were to make everything in your life, everything and everyone, sacred? What would happen? What do you think might happen if you did that? If you dared to do that? What would happen if you stopped cursing your body or your job or your a certain politician who will not be named? <laughs> or your neighbor's dog? Or spam? Or Honolulu traffic? Or the rail, oh my God, there's a good one. Yes, what would happen if you blessed it and made it sacred, made it a sacred rail instead of whatever else you are calling it? Make it sacred. I think that's the only way to function in life, to know that it's all working together for good. It's all working together as a part of the plan. It's all happening for you and not to you. That's the important thing that we need to know in our life. You know, on the mainland, we, ha- we believe in voodoo on the mainland. I don't know if you knew that, but we do. Um, there's a certain voodoo sign that is given on the mainland that makes people freak out. And it's your middle finger. I don't know if you've noticed that, but when people raise their middle finger on the mainland, they go, oh my God, look what happened there, and they go freaking out, and they give it so much power, but your middle finger doesn't have any power, any more power than any of the other fingers. But it does because you think it does, because you give it that power. Now here in Hawaii, we give them the shaka sign, right? And I understand that came from the surfers. People would cut in in front of a guy when he was surfing, and instead of giving him the finger, they'd give him the chakra sign. Hang loose, brother. You're included. Stay with us. You're part of the whole. We celebrate you as you are a part of our lives. There's a story in the Old Testament of Jacob who is wrestling with an angel at the stream of Jabbok, and uh, it's symbolic of all those things that you and I are struggling with and wrestling with on a day-to-day basis. And some of them, we don't seem to be able to overcome. They won't let us go. In fact, this angel says, I won't let you go until you bless me. And so, Jacob blesses the angel, and he lets go, and Jacob's name is changed at that moment from Jacob to Israel. And that's a pretty powerful name. Have you ever had a problem that won't let you go? That won't seemingly go away? What if you made it sacred? (laughs) What if you blessed it? What do you think might happen? It might let you go. So, I leave you with that thought today. The possibility that everything and everyone in the whole wide world, and that includes some pretty interesting people and situations. They're all sacred, and when you make them sacred, it changes them, and it changes you, and it changes the world. Thank you for this sacred opportunity to be with you this morning. (laughs) 